I will begin. Dearly Father, we uh, thank you for this day, and I uh, thank you for the students. We uh, thank you for the break, which is soon starting. Help us to uh, just make the most of this time, Lord. You know my pray. Amen. All right, so let me get right into it. This is example 8 from section 2.8. And here's the, here's the claim, G abelian. And the order of G equal to P squared, where P is prime. All right. Then here's the punchline. G is either isomorphic to the cyclic group. Um, I keep making my C's into complex C's. That's not good. Um, this is <laughs> CP squared. Right? Or your group is isomorphic to um, the direct product of CP and CP. So it's, it's either a cyclic group or it's the direct product of cyclic groups of order P and P. So here's the proof. Um, <clears throat> if G not cyclic, all right, then there exists G not equal to 1, right, with order of G equal to P. By Lagrange's theorem, the only possible orders of elements are 1, P, and P squared. P squared's out because G is not cyclic, right? So by, this is by Lagrange's theorem. The order of, there has to be an order of P element G. And so then you can write H equal to the cyclic subgroup generated by G. And you notice by counting, H has P things in it. Okay, technically by the cyclic subgroup section. Fine, fine, fine. You got me. And then if we pick, let's say X, which is not an element of H, right, with x not equal to 1, we can do that, right? Because g's got p squared things in it, and hl's only got p of them. So there's more out there. Then, um, <clears throat> excuse me. Then, of course, the, the order of x must also be p. And these, if we say k is equal to the cyclic subgroup generated by x, that has... <clears throat> the order of uh, k is also equal to p. All right. So you can count. Observe the order of h times the order of k is equal to what? It's p times p, which is the order of g, right? And we also know we got this, what else do we got? We've also got that H and K are normal subgroups of G, right? Because G is abelian. So every subgroup is normal in an abelian group. What else do we have? We also can argue that H intersect K is just one, right? Why? Suppose it's not one, then it's a subgroup. But it's a subgroup of G. It's a subgroup of G which must have orders what? The only possible orders for subgroups of G are 1, P, and P squared, right? So it can't be all of G. So if, if, if the intersection wasn't one, then that means H has to be equal to K, which contradicts the fact that X is not an H. So it must be that they intersect to be one. So you got all three of those things, then what can we do? So these three things together imply by the results we went through last time that G is isomorphic to H cross K, which of course is clearly isomorphic to CP cross CP. And then otherwise it's cyclic. I'm using 
uh, but, uh, but, uh, but, uh, corollary 2 to theorem 6 right now for my punchline there. Any questions? Um, we've already dealt with this before, but he, he, he points out, you know, cautionary remark, and it's, it's a nice one, uh, which is Q8. You know what Q8 is. This is this uh, quaternion 8 group, plus or minus 1, plus or minus i, plus or minus j, plus or minus k, right? It's every subgroup is normal, right? Every subgroup is normal despite Q8 being non-abelian. So it is possible, um, it's possible to have a non-abelian group in which every subgroup is normal, right? So these are not, um, I mean, what are the subgroups of Q? You either have H is equal to like, plus or minus i, or plus or minus j, or plus or minus k. These all have order 4, right? So therefore, the index of such h in g is um, 8 divided by 4, also known as 2. So these uh, are subgroups. Um, with index 2, which means they're normal. And then the other subgroup that you can think about in Q8 is just the uh, minus 1, 1 subgroup, but this um, I think is also the center of Q8. So that commutes with everything. I mean, so that's, that's also a normal subgroup. Anyway, all the subgroups you can find, they're normal. So, definition. G is simple <laughs> if um, G is not equal to the stupid group, technical term, and the, um, sorry, I've lost my track, oh, and the only normal subgroups are of G, RG and 1. So like the, the quintessential simple group is what? What's that again? Oh yeah, any, any like Z, let's say ZP since we keep talking about AKA CP, right? Any, um, if we just have the uh, a cyclic group of prime order, well, I'm sorry, a group of prime order is automatically what? Cyclic, so yeah. So this has only what? Zero and ZP as subgroups. And of course, every subgroup's normal because ZP is what? Abelian, right? So that's sort of the, the quintessential simple groups are just the groups of prime order, right? Those are, those are simple groups because they only have the subgroups of themselves in one. And, um, you know, theorem seven, well, theorem seven says an abelian group G not equal to one. I won't, I won't prove it, I'm just going to state it for you. An abelian. I don't think it's that hard to prove, but abelian group G not equal to 1 is simple um, if and only if um, it is cyclic of prime order. Half of this theorem we proved before, but so so 
So those are the only. What this says then is, if you're looking for abelian groups and you're looking for which abelian groups are simple, then it's pretty simple. Sorry, that was, that was bad. But it's going to happen. Yes? Is there a particular reason that we exclude the stupid groups? Yeah. It's in the definition. So, um, so why? Hmm. Let's think about that. If uh, n is greater than or equal to 5, then, and this hurts, um, a n is simple. So the end of section, the end of section 2.8, it spends about a page deriving this bit by glorious bit. It's a technical, gory cycle calculation, which I invite you to read. But it can be shown that if we have the alternating group, this is the subgroup of even permutations in SN, right? Um, there is no um, normal subgroups of that thing except for itself and the identity if n is greater than or equal to 5. On the other hand, um, in the next section actually, uh, norm well in this section already I skipped it I think, but a normal subgroup is given of A4. There is a normal subgroup to A4. So. Um, maybe, let's keep that question in mind, Sam. I'm not trying to dismiss you completely. I just don't have a good answer for it right off the top of my head. Um, let's see, what would happen um, if I allowed the identity group to be simple? Is that just saying that the stupid group isn't simple? I think it would ruin... I think that would ruin statements about, like, I, one of my ultimate goal, one of our ultimate goals in group theory is to sort of write things as products of simple groups. And if I allowed one to be, the stupid group to be a simple group, then I'd always be able to, like, tack on more of those into the classification. So, so is it like why we don't define one to be prime? It's very much the same as why we don't make one prime, yeah. Okay. Yeah, there, there may be other reasons than that, but... That's what sticks out to me right now. <coughs> okay, so, finally, man, section 2.8 is very long. <laughs> Goodness gracious. Factor groups. <laughs> so, suppose that K is a normal subgroup of G, right? Um, meaning what? Uh, GK is equal to KG for all G and G, right? We had other characterizations, but that's one. That was our definition. Um, let's see here. Assume that Ka is equal to Ka prime and Kb is equal to Kb prime. All right, so what I'm saying is that A and A prime and B and B prime are two different representatives, right, of this, these, this particular coset, pair of cosets we're considering. And what I want to calculate is, what does this mean then? A, um, A prime, A inverse is in K, right, and what's this say? B prime, B inverse is in K, right? The reason I put the prime first is just because I didn't write the right parentheses. It's not deep or anything. So consider, um, you know, let's see here. Let's see this. Uh, I would like to show that K A B is equal to K A prime B prime. Is this true? What does it take to show that that's true? If I want to prove the thing I'm about to box in red to be true, what, what condition do I need on A B A prime and B prime? What would it, what would it take? to prove that these cosets are equal. What would that, what's this equivalent to? Mm -hmm. 
is in K, right? OK, so let's see why that's true. Is this true? So let's consider that. Let's study A prime, B prime, AB inverse, which is equal to what? That's A prime, B prime, B inverse, A inverse, right? Let's see here. So if you look at this, what is this? It's in K, right? And we know that we know that we know that K A inverse is equal to A inverse K, right? So I've got right in here, if you look at this expression, look at this, that's something where? That's something in this guy, right? So we can rewrite that as a prime a inverse times uh, let's say k2 right for some k2 and k right by the normality of k by the fact that the a inverse k and k a inverse cosets have to be equal agree but then what do we have We've got A prime A inverse, which we know is in K. And we've got this, which we know is in K. So all together is again in K, right? <coughs> so therefore, normality of K means that KAB is equal to KA prime B prime. So, with this in hand, I can make a definition. Um, we define uh, G mod K for K normal in G um, by, first of all, G mod K as a, as a, as a, as a, uh, um, as a point set. This is KA such that A is in G, right? With binary operation. How do we define it? Ka times Kb is equal to Kab. Okay? And this thing right here is called the factor group. Factor group of G by K. So all I've really proved for you so far is that the operation is well defined. It's clear that it's into right cosets. All right, by construction, Ka times Kb is Kab. Well, Kab is a right coset, so it's, a, it's definitely into. It's definitely single valued because the calculation we just did shows it's independent of the representative used. Right? So what remains to then to prove that the factor group is, in fact, an actual honest-to-goodness group? What do we need? We need identity, inverses, and what else? Associativity, right? We already got closure. Um, so what's the identity in this factor group? It's just K itself. Can you prove that? So why is, why is G mod K group, right, subject to KA times KB equal to KAB? Right. Notice that k times 1 is equal to k. Right? And k 
k um, k1 right times k a is equal to k times 1 a which is equal to k a right which is equal to by the way also k a1 which is equal to k a k1 right here I'm using the fact that the multiplication is well defined a bunch of times. Anyway, the point is K serves us as the identity. All right, number one. Number two, if you calculate K A inverse times K A, right, you get K A A A inverse A, which is K, right, which is again K times A, K times one, which again is K times a A inverse, which is K A, K A inverse, again using the well-defined multiplication. So what do you got? So this calculation shows thus K A parentheses inverse is equal to K A inverse for each K A in the factor group. Although, again, I really shouldn't call it a group at this juncture. I'm like one more calculation away from earning the right to call it a group, right? Just because you call it a group doesn't make it a group, right? Proof is required. You're like, I already read the section, so it's a group to me. Fine. You got me. Can't argue with that. Um, okay, so associativity. We got KA, KB, KC. And so this, this way. So that's KA, KBC, right? Which is KA times BC by associativity of the group. That's AB times C by definition of the multiplication. That's KAB, KC, which then is, of course, KA, KB, KC. Okay, so great, it's associative. And the associativity is stolen directly from the associativity of the group. Honestly, once you prove the operations well defined, the rest of this stuff is kind of obvious. The well definedness of the operation is the thing that's a little bit subtle. I think. You can disagree. No, you can't. I forbid it. Let's see here. We're, we're past agreeing to disagree in society now. If you disagree with me, you are a bigot. And I must shame you through social media into accepting my viewpoint. This is, this is a new way of being. I'm sorry. Go enjoy your time over break with your family and such. See here. Does that mean class is dismissed? No. It does not. Nice try, though. All right, so <clears throat> theorem. Um, to three, four, five. Um, number one is if we define phi of A equals to KA, defines the coset map. So I'm putting a definition in a theorem. I hope you don't mind. This is theorem one of section 2.9. We've already done point number one here and here, kind of. Defines coset map um, that goes from where? It goes from G to the right, uh, to, the, to the factor group, G mod K. And in fact, this is a homomorphism. It's also called the natural map or the coset map. It's a surjective homomorphism. Number three, if G abelian, then guess what? G mod K abelian. If G is cyclic with generator A, then guess what? The factor group G mod K is, is, is cyclic and it's generated by the representative, the coset generated by the generator of A. So it's, in fact, it's cyclic with generator K A. Five, if um, G is a finite index, 
well, excuse me, if k is a finite index, this doesn't mean that g, that g is finite just yet. So if the index of k and g is finite, can you give me an example of g not, not, in, not finite but has finite index? z, right, good example. Then the order of the coset, uh, excuse me, the order of the factor group is equal to the index. Yeah. Yes. Moreover, number one we already did before this theorem was stated. If in addition, that's on purpose. I'm trying to keep the numbering the same as the text, but I reject putting one inside the discussion of this theorem. I wanted to discuss it before the theorem. Yep. Oh, yeah. You know, I wish I had been using H everywhere. I hate my Ks. They're ugly. Um, Anyway, it's too late now. Uh, if in addition, g is finite, um, then we have that um, g over k, the factor group, has order of g. It's, it's, its order is the order of g divided by the order of k. This notation essentially means that if you understand nothing about what we're doing, you might still get the right answer. <laughs> right? <laughs> Isn't that? <laughs> it's uh, kind of like certain parts of algebraic topology for me. I got the right answer even though I didn't understand what I was doing because the notation is so good. <laughs> anyway, that would take me a while to explain. Um, all right, so let's prove these things. It will take us so very long. Uh, the, uh, check, check this out. So phi of AB is KAB is KAKB is phi of A, phi of B. Yeah, it's a homomorphism. The fact that it's surjective, um, you give me a right coset. Anybody, pick one. Yes. Phi of X. There you go. Um, abelian. If G is abelian, this, uh, the, the factor group's abelian. How about this? So we got Ka, Kb equals to K, this is getting boring, which is Kba, which is Kb, Ka. Okay, so this I'm assuming G is abelian, right? If G is abelian, then we can commute the representatives and consequently we can commute the cosets, so the factor group is likewise abelian. Um, cyclic. So let's see here. Uh, let's see here. This one I might actually need to think about a little bit. So if G is cyclic and um, we have K is a what? A subgroup of, of G, right? It's automatically normal because G is abelian if it's cyclic. So every subgroup is normal. But if it's a subgroup of a cyclic group, K is what? It's generated to by A to the power something. Um, I heard Pac-Man was a desirable symbol to use, so put it there. If you prefer to write that as a B, you may. I heard there was some, some debate. Um, so, uh, yeah. Anyway, so um, if, we, if, we, if we then look at uh, Kg, right, then that's what? That's, uh, I'm trying to show that this is cyclic. Um, oh, man, I'm stumped all of a sudden. So this is, uh, K is, is, of course, G is, what do you say, A to the M? Something, yeah. So KG is? Yeah, say again? Yeah, I mean, it's, um, it's the set A to the J Pac-Man uh, plus M such that J is in Z. 
don't know if that helps me though. I feel like I'm wandering here. Just, this was not a hard thing. I'm, I'm making this unnecessarily complicated. Oh, yeah, duh. Sorry. This does not matter. You guys and your discussion of Pac-Man. See what you've done to me? So the point of this was this. If we have, if we have, if we have kg, right, that's equal to k a to some power j. Lemma. That is equal to k a to the power j. You could prove this by induction if you like. It wouldn't be hard, right? Couldn't you do that just by using the property of the phi? Also that, that'd be good proof. I like that. Since we already did the induction for that, why not? Very good, very good. But anyway, the point is once you do that, then it's clear that this is generated by that, right? But that's an arbitrary thing in the factor group. So this implies that g mod k is equal to ka as claimed. And number five is really just counting, all right? So rather than prove it, let me just illustrate it with an example. Um, now, the, the infinite example is a good one. Where am I? Example... Ah, this is example one. So um, if we let g equal to z, right? And if we let, say, k equal to nz, then this number five tells us what? It tells us that z mod nz, right? The size of this is equal to the index of z um, with nz. Which is what? If n equals 2, we're looking at even and odd numbers, right? And so forth. So this we've looked at before. This was just n. And it's not hard to see, in fact, that zn, in truth, is what? It is, in fact, nothing more than the factor group of z by nz. In our construction, that's not an isomorphism, that's actually inequality, right? Because the equivalence classes of integers are the ones we add. Like one bar is the equivalence class mod n, right? I mean, it's the set of all the residues of, of one. So this is actually straight up an inequality, and we've been using a factor group from week, like week one. We just didn't call it a factor group, did we? But it is a factor group the quintessential one. <clears throat> what else can we say? Don't worry, we've got more to say about that coset map. So this is example one of section 2.9. He points out that G, of course, G is normal in G, right? And the stupid group is normal in G, right? So each one of these defines a factor. Any normal subgroup defines a factor group, right? That's what this we just did says. Normal groups are the ones which we can factor by, meaningfully in group theory. So what's, what's, what's G mod G? That's also read G mod G. That's isomorphic to what? And what's... What's g mod 1 isomorphic to? <laughs> right? G mod g is just isomorphic to 1 if we're working multiplicatively. And this is isomorphic to g again. If you want me to give you the isomorphism, it's really obnoxious. So psi of a is equal to a is the isomorphism from g to this most annoying of all possible um, quotients. 
See, because what this does is it says that every point in G is in an equivalence class by itself. And how do you multiply them? You multiply them with the group multiplication. So it's just, it's like a very, very annoying just curly bracketing of G. And this is the, this is the, the this is the isomorphism explicitly, but stupidly. All right. There are many nice examples. Here's one. This is example three of section 2.9. And here we have K is um, the identity permutation 1, 2, 3, 4. Those are two transpositions. 1, 3, 2, 4. Again, two transpositions. Um, 1, 4, 2, 3. Again, two transpositions. This is, in fact, a normal subgroup of A4 that's shown in section 2.8. Sorry, we didn't have time for it in class. And um, you, can, you can work out the different right cosets to this, all right? And then you can draw the Cayley table. So the right cosets to this actually are K itself, um, K times 1, 2, 3. and k times 1, 3, 2. All right, so let's see here. We can fill out this Cayley table. I'll do the first row and column. I have definitely enough, I have enough mental energy to do that one for sure. Let's see here. So we've got k. We've got k times 1, 2, 3. We've got k times 1, 3, 2. We've got k times 1, 2, 3. We've got k times 1, 3, 2. Right? You notice that the order of a to the, you know, the alternating group a4 mod k is what? What's the order of this? It's the order of a4, which is finite, divided by the order of k right? Which is what? That's actually 12. How big is k? 4. So we know that this is a group of order 3, right? And it's like the fact that these are the representative, it just comes from explicitly multiplying things in A4, I mean things in S4 rather, by this you get four, dis you, get, you get these three distinct uh, sets, all right? They're explicitly given in the text. Um, so how would we multiply this? Like, what happens here? One, two, three squared, right. Okay, so one, two, three, one, would you say one, two, three squared is one, three, two. So that means that when we take k times this times k times that, we get k times that, right? If you allow me to weasel that in there. So... This is k times 1, 3, 2, right? So if this is going to be a group, what has to be here? It's got to be k. This got to be k. Process of elimination, k times 1, 2, 3. Of course, you can actually multiply the representatives and get that 1, 3, 2 times 1, 3, 2 is 1, 2, 3 as well. So there you go. That's the Cayley table for the factor group of A4 by, by K. In fact, this is a cyclic group, right? You notice that A4 mod K is generated by what? You really can't go wrong here. But 1, 2, 3, for example. Why can't you go wrong? We're talking about a cyclic group of order 3. So both non-identity elements are generators. What's that? Oh, you chose the identity? <laughs> no. But you're smarter than that. I was trying to assume a smart student. So. I, think, I don't think he really chose the identity. I think he's messing with me. So, yeah, just to be clear. <laughs> so, OK, 
Okay, I must move on. <laughs> uh, let me actually do the same example again, but from a different perspective. Let's look at Z6. Ah, how does he do that? <laughs> Ew. I just, I can't, I can't do it. No. Man, you should see the calculus one test he just gave. Whoa, it's, it's, oh, it's amazing. It's, that thing is beastly. He had 10 people make an A on that. There are some rising stars in that class, I'll tell you that right now. Anyway, so another example would be, I could take Z6. This is not in the textbook, but I thought it'd be nice to have one that's not in the textbook. I could take K equal to multiples 3 times Z6, also known as 0, 3. And so like K plus 1, 1, 4, K plus 2, uh, 2, 5, all right? And so I can form the factor group. It's an abelian group, so of course um, this K is normal, right? And so here it is. I've got uh, Z6 mod um, 3Z6, right? And so I'll, I'll write K, K plus 1, K plus 2, K, K plus 1, K plus 2. And this one, I can do the math a little bit easier. K, K plus 1, K plus 2, K plus 1, K plus 2. K plus 1 plus 1 is K plus 2. That one gives me back K again, because 3 is 0, mod um, mod k, mod k, <coughs> notice that mod k 3 is 0. Not mod 6, but mod k 3 is 0, because 3 is in k. So it's essentially like 0. This 1 plus, that's why I got k here, because I got k plus 3, which is k, okay? And then, again, this gives me k, and then finally I get k plus 4, which is, by the way, equal to k plus 1 because we can absorb k elements into k. Them's the rules, right? I really like the structure of this book. You guys have had the opportunity to kind of be playing with cosets for a little while before you actually hit this concept, hit, hit this construction of factor group, which is nice. It's actually nice. Not every book does all this stuff that he did in the last section with product groups before, product subgroups before he actually hits the factor group construction. And I think it's a really nice um, sort of on-ramp to the construction of factor group. All right, what's next? Do, 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 do. Of course, these are the same group, right? Those are both Z3 in disguise. Oh man, he has so many nice examples in this section. Theorem 2. Suppose, thank you, G has K, a subgroup of the center of G, sorry, subgroup, um, such that G mod K is cyclic. Then, G is abelian. So this one actually requires a little bit, a little bit more thought. The proof, 
but it's not, it's not too bad. Um, it's actually quite enjoyable. So suppose K is a subset of the center of G, all right? And we're also supposing that the factor group G by K is generated by something, so let's say KG. There you go. Yes, I should assume. I, I really should assume. I mean, I have to assume. I'm saying that we're forming the factor group here. Right. So I'm, I'm, I must be assuming that K is normal. So. But of course, the fact that K is a subset of the center, I think, gives us normality. Oh, that's true. Yeah. So if A and B are in G, all right, I want to show that AB is equal to BA. That's my goal, right? But on the way there, I need to gather some data. Then KA, right, is equal to KG to some power J, and KB is equal to KG to some power, let's say, L, right? That has to be the case because the factor group is cyclic. And I'm using the lemma. Hence, there exist, let's say, k1 and k2 in k, which is a subset of the center, right, for which um, a is equal to k1 g to the j, and b is equal to k2 g to the power l. Now we have everything we need to play. Let's play the game. a, b equals to b, a. Who will win? I think we'll win. We're going to win. We're going to win. Let's see here. So I'll start here. a, b. a was k1 g to the j. K1 G to the J, K2 G to the L, right? But now, remember, um, what do we what do we know about uh, um, K? K is um, where's K? K commutes with everything, right? So I can commute. I got K1 uh, K2 G to the J, G to the L, right? also known as K1, K2, G to the L, G to the J, right? Because you can commute the same element to different powers. If you like, that's G to the J plus L, but J plus L is L plus J, so there it is. And then what? Um, what am I trying to get to? K2. All right, then I can move this over to here because K is the K1's in the center, right? K1. And there you go. B, A. A and B being arbitrary, we've proved that uh, G is a billion. So the, um, the remainder of the section here, he describes an interesting construction called the, the commutator subgroup or the derived subgroup, which essentially gives us a way of understanding if the quotient's going to be abelian. Right? I mean, you can have a non-abelian group where you somehow take all of that non commutedness like that non-commuting part of it, and just put it into the zero, right? 
you factor by that non-abelian piece and you're left with an abelian factor group, right? The question is like, what's the, what's the smallest chunk that you could sort of divide by and leave yourself an abelian quotient? This is what the derived or commutator subgroup does for you. It's the smallest subgroup such that G mod G prime is abelian. So that's what we'll talk about a little bit next time is this idea of the derived subgroup and how that, how that gives you this, the sort of the, the largest quotient actually, which is abelian. Because if this is, if this is the smallest subgroup, right, that this happens for, that makes this the largest quotient. Of course, you can always do what? You can always take G, you can always like quotient by G itself and get back the stupid group, that's abelian. But it's, the question is like, what's the biggest subgroup that you can, I'm sorry, what's the smallest subgroup you can quotient by to leave as much as possible not being sort of identified with zero? See, the bigger you quotient by, the more you're sort of shoving to be the identity. Whatever, whatever you divide by, that's the thing you're making into the identity. So, anyway, this is a new idea. We'll be working with it for most of the rest of the semester, so get used to it. Yep. Thanks, guys. Have a good break.